Yeah, your first visit to Swansea Grand Theatre as a performer was... Was, uh, well, uh, John Giovas saw me and um, he decided that he wanted me to be his Joseph in his production of his take on Joseph. And um, I, of course, agreed because I was just out of pop uh, then uh, with my group Flintlock. Flintlock. So it was a great little step in to treading the boards. And, um, you know, he was brilliant because John was from the old school anyway. Um, and he had lots of great vision and great techniques about stagecraft, which maybe these days you don't quite get the same kind of knowledge around you. Um, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. We had a three week run here. Uh, Martin Yates was the MD and um, it was brilliant. Uh, Des Barrett, who was a local, uh, again, he was uh, Potiphar and um, he did really well. And he was Jacob as well because they tend to double up um, playing the two different parts. And um, all together it was a great experience and we all got on so well and we had such a cracking time that uh, John said, well look, I've got the Chuckle Brothers coming in for Panto, um, how about doing Panto? And then they got Harry H. Corbett to come in to top and then I joined him and then the Chuckle Brothers came on board and uh, Des Barrett came on board again as well as Dane, who's a larger than life character, I don't know if you know Des, but he's brilliant. Um, and um, again, well, we were talking about this just the other day. We were throwing Easter eggs out. That's how far and long the runs used to run for. We opened mid-December and we were still running the end of March. It'd be classed as a missile now, wouldn't it, an Easter egg? I mean, yeah, health and safety wouldn't allow you to do it, uh, which is a shame. Um, I think it's fun, you know, the throwing of the sweets and things for the kids. Uh, but um, yeah, we ran and ran and well, that ran. March the 7th, Yeah, that's when you finished the... There you go, you've got the dates there. Um, and um, all together again, a great ex experience. But the Chuckle Brothers and myself got on really well particularly. Um, and again, it was another great way of getting into theatre as a, as a commodity because when you're doing 12 shows a week, it can be a bit of a culture shock if you're not used to it. So that was brilliant. So we had a great season there and uh, John Quirk, Quirk was the MD for the Panto. Um, and um, I think that was the run of a very long relationship with different shows that came to the Grand. Um, and uh, what I love about the Swansea um, audiences and the South Welsh audiences, if they like you, and I would always go to the stage door, and I'd always spend time and chat and go to the bar, but of course in those days, this, as we were saying earlier, was just basically the back end of the bus station. The theatre itself was much smaller, not the auditorium of course, but the backstage area was very cramped and very small. So it's very much changed now, um, but it made it more intimate, you know. And uh, so I did spend a lot of time with the audiences and signed their programmes and whatever, and therefore had a really good rapport with the audience um, at large, which was lovely. Whenever I came to the area, I'd go on Griff's show on the local radio station, and every time I came near the Swansea, it was like, come on, come on the radio, let's have a chat, what are you doing now, what are you up to? Which was lovely. Um, and then I came here with Greece. Uh, there was a tour of Godspell I did um, in the early 80s, mid 80s. Um, that came here for a week or two. Um, and then, um, we did Joseph, of course, many times. That was Bill Kenwright's Joseph. I toured in that for three and three quarter years, and that did go to the West End. We went to the Royalty in 1985. But I came to the Grand maybe three or four times with that production of Joseph. Um, and then I've done you know, various fundraising. Uh, one was for John Chilvers, of course, um, and Viv Ellicott was involved with that as well. Hi Viv, wherever you are out there. He's again um, a great con contributor, I think, to Swansea Grand's success in those days, along with especially John Chilvers. Um, so I think out of all the theatres in the UK at large, I think the Swansea Grand is the one I've played mm, the most consistently over the years, which is lovely, and I love it. So wh when you stayed in the pantomime, oh, where did you live? Well, um, we stayed up in the Mumbles, and there's a um, chalet complex up there, um, Cresso Cottages. Welcome Cottages was the company and we stayed up, um, it was right on the um, cliff edge, that's the only way I can describe it and most of us, well when I did Joseph here for John Chilvers we all stayed up there um, and most of the time I've stayed in Swansea working at the theatre I've always stayed down there because I love it, 
it's really nice. The Gower Peninsula is beautiful, so you can take in those lovely views. And again, I've got lots of friends down there as well, which is lovely. And good nightclubs in those days. Absolutely. Oh, Harper's. Where's Harper's gone? It's vanished. It's now a funny little... Well, it's shut up now. There's nothing there. Um, and the funny thing is about arriving this time around, I haven't been to Swansea for maybe a year and a half, is this one-way system. I mean, is that confusing or is it just me? <laughs> it threw me completely. And I've been here all this week. Have, have you seen the Bendy job. bus? No. Big, uh, how long is it? Oh, is it one of these double ones with the corrugated, it looks like a... What is it? An accordion in the middle. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Playing tunes. <laughs> no, I haven't seen that yet. Um, but no, it's very confusing now, quite frankly, getting around the building, uh, around the town centre at the moment. So, um, not quite so sure whether they've done a good or a bad thing there. I can't quite make my mind up on that one. Um, but no, the, the Chuckle Brothers and myself particularly had many a good night out at Harper's. <laughs> Do you think pantomimes have changed since those days? Um, dramatically. And some for good. I mean, obviously, technology is always great. Talking of technology, what's hilarious, I'm also talking to Roger Price with the new book of the Tomorrow People, 40 years on. And um, talking of technology moving on, um, when you look at the Tomorrow People in the early days, then it was revolutionary. Now, bits of the sets move and you've got these bouncy balls pretending to be the living skins for those of you that know the series of Tomorrow People I'm talking about. I do. Mm -hmm. um, and it's hysterical now looking back and watching it but of course then it was revolutionary. Same with pantomime. You didn't have the technology and you didn't have the um, microphones. You, you had the raw talent of the performers. So you had to project and use your voice properly to get over the band. I mean, I can remember doing pantomime here um, and you had foot mics, the float mics, um, but you had an eight, 10 piece orchestra and you had to sing over it at the end of the day. So you develop the technique and the way of doing it. Same with the performers, you had variety acts, you had special acts that came in. All right, technically they're not part of the story, but panto is about fun. Um, and also it helped performers come into the industry and try their act out and get to know the audiences and experiment and it spawned great magicians uh, Paul Daniels for example uh, came through Variety and Panto to learn his craft so where I personally think it's changed is that the artistry element the slapstick the craft of pantomime I personally feel that a lot of that is being lost now because it's mainly television people that are coming straight through into pantomime and therefore that craft, I fear, may be losing it now a little bit. And um, whether that's good or bad, that's up to the audiences. But from an artistic point of view, I think the fun of slapstick and the craft of true, what, what I call panto craft artists, I don't think you can beat it. And you mentioned speciality acts there. Duval, from, Duval. Uh, was quite legendary uh, in stories from uh, years gone by here. Yeah. Any stories you can think of? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, one of his live doves, <laughs> we were doing the Pento run, and he went to do the big show, and bless it, it had died. So, nothing happened. Um, we were laughing in the wings. It wasn't, I suppose, terribly funny artistically at the time for him, but it got a laugh and we got round it. But that's one thing that sticks out in my mind, um, particularly. But he was just a very fun... And again, fun guy to work with, had loads of stories to tell, you know, of his days in the clubs. He's quite elderly as well, isn't he? Very elderly. I mean, I don't know whether he's still with us now, frankly, because he would have been mid to late 50s then. So he's got to be in his 80s now if he's still with us. And, uh, but a great character, great fun. Him and Harry H. Corbett got on very well because Harry H. Corbett loved, loved his juggling. And he was a bit sort of circus orientated. So him and Deval used to chit chat and talk and, you know, spend the day, you know, com uh, comparing stories. So, yeah. How did you find the uh, audiences, the audiences? Well, I can't say enough about them because they were good to me. Um, they embraced me um, as a performer. Um, and whenever I came here with the show, I was always received very well by the radio stations and the press, and particularly the audiences, you know, entrance rounds and things like that, and money can't buy that, you know. Um, very warm. If they love you in South Wales, 
they show it. And just going away from pantomime a second, from something I looked at last night, Pauline's Quirk, if you can remember. Yes. I saw a, a clip of you uh, doing some sort of uh, magic act on there, <laughs> which was uh, quite funny. Do you still keep in touch with her? Yes, not so much nowadays, um, because obviously she's just been out on tour with uh, Leslie Joseph doing Birds of a Feather. Um, and um, we don't see an awful lot of each other in the modern world um, because of work and paths going in very different directions. Um, but fond memories again, and yes, because of a release of a um, You Must Be Joking DVD, which is one of my first television shows with Flintlock, we're going back to 77 now, um, and of course Pauline was involved with that, with Ray Burdish and John Blundell, and it's just been released on DVD this June of this year, so there's a lot of footage on YouTube coming out, and when we recorded all this material, of course it was all done out of sequence, so I never saw the completed journey. I never saw the completed episodes. So for the first time I'm going on YouTube and I'm seeing them for the first time myself. So there's a lot out there at the moment, yeah. And did you enjoy your time with Flintlock as uh, you were the drummer, weren't you? That's right, I was the drummer, came to the forefront of, as the drummer vocalist towards the end because Derek lost his voice. Um, but fond memories, I mean, you know, I was 13 then um, and I was doing the Tomorrow People I was doing Flintlock, uh, touring, doing the concerts, and um, recording the albums. So for a young chap of 13, I, I was doing a hell of a workload. And uh, looking back now, it was something that um, I would never have changed, um, but it was hard. It wasn't easy, but very enjoyable. And to all those that know. obviously are connected to the Swansea Grand Theatre, particularly obviously with pantomime this year coming up, um, well done. I know the Friends of the Theatre is still quite a big energy ball here um, and they should be congratulated because they are a very important part of keeping this theatre going. Um, and uh, to all those new ones that maybe are taking the helm now, I know Gary Arles left recently, I believe, and um, he was a very good friend and uh, I wish them all good luck and well. And look after this theatre because I hold it very close to my heart and um, to all those that support it, well done. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.